our presentation today. All right. Well, good morning and afternoon and evening to all of you out there. Uh, my name is Mark Dirks and on behalf of Choice and the Association of College and Research Libraries, I'd like to welcome you to our program today, Emerging from COVID-19, Lessons for the Future of Education, which is supported by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's iLibrary and the Directorate of Educate for Education and Skills. Today's discussion is one in a series of webinars from Choice and ACRL that addresses new ideas and develops a, and developments of interest to the academic, library, and research communities. Before we get started, I'd like to point out just a couple of features of the webinar software. Please note that all of the attendees today are muted um, and your cameras are automatically disabled. So please don't worry about generating noise or feedback or anything of that nature that should be taken care of for you. In the main area of the screen, of course, you can follow along with the presentation materials. And we are, in addition, using the Q&A feature. So if you have any questions for our speaker, please drop them right in that Q&A box as they come to you. Um, we'll take some time at the end to get to as many questions as we can. Um, unfortunately, we almost always have more questions than we can get to. So if we don't get to yours, we, we apologize. Um, please just know that our, our time is limited and we'll do our best. Um, also, I would note that there is closed captioning available for today's session. Um, to toggle the automated captions on or off, you can uh, use the little CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Also note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to that archive version. And our speaker today is Andreas Schleicher. Mr. Schleicher is Director of the Education and Skills Directorate and Special Advisor on Education Policy to the Secretary General at the OECD in Paris. He initiated and oversees the Program for International Student Assessment, PISA, and other international instruments that have created a global platform for policymakers, researchers, and educators across, across nations and cultures to innovate and transform educational policies and practice. He has worked for over 20 years with ministers and education leaders around the world to improve quality and equity in, in education. So with that, um, it is my pleasure to turn things over to, to Mr. Schleicher. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mark, for the kind introduction and for hosting us today. It's a pleasure to join you all. It's a difficult time still for education. I think we need to uh, acknowledge this. You know, the coronavirus is rarely dangerous for children, but there has probably been more no group that has suffered more from the public policy responses to contain this pandemic. Now, if you think about school closures over the last year, uh, when we actually tracked that with our survey, you can see some countries have done quite well. If you look to countries like Denmark, Germany or New Zealand, school closures have been fairly limited, but you can see Costa Rica or Colombia essentially losing the entire school year. And uh, school is not just a place for ac academic learning, but particularly uh, for children from disadvantaged background, often a very important, stable social environment. So. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> social emotional losses are even harder to recover than academic losses. So a time of disruption. Uh, one thing that is interesting, you know, if you factor in the infection rates, you can see that there's actually almost no relationship between the extent of school closures and infection rate. Now, the size of the bubble is basically the number of COVID cases per million inhabitants last year. And you can see if the infection rate would drive school closures, you'd see all the large bubbles at the top and all the small bubbles at the bottom. But you can see it's really all over the place. In fact, if you want to understand that relationship, you have to add in another variable. And that's actually the capacity, the quality of education itself. We measure this through the learning outcomes in education. We test students regularly. We did that last in 2018. And if you actually take those results into account, somehow countries line up. Now, what you can see actually the frontline capacity of education systems, now that then translates into better quality, that seems the best predictor for school closures. 
In other words, where you had education systems with a lot of frontline capacity, they were able, even in a difficult pandemic context, to keep uh, schools open. There could also be other factors at play, you know, countries that place great value on education, for which education is really, really important. They have done whatever it takes to keep schools open, even in difficult pandemic situations. But that's really important that there is no kind of automaticity in the link between infection rates and school closures. Actually, the you know, capacity of education systems, the resilience of education systems is a better predictor for this. And that even holds, you know, after accounting for GDP. Now, let's jump back to uh, this year when we actually uh, looked in uh, uh, spring this year, in February, uh, still close, many schools were closed in countries. And what you can see also, the choices that countries make. You can really see at the beginning of the pandemic, everything was shut down. Then countries figured out that the alternative solutions, digital learning and so on, were much less well for younger children. Uh, and there you could basically see that schools uh, were, you know, more frequently closed for older children, for younger children. That basically, most countries you can see here in February, even when the pandemic was still very tough in countries, uh, they kept primary schools open, even if they closed or partially closed uh, secondary education. Now, that's, uh, I think, a very important trend that we have seen. It's perhaps the first lesson to take from the pandemic that actually the presence, the schooling in presence is particularly important for the youngest children and also for children from disadvantage. But then obviously, you know, during school closures, people tried other things. And while this has been a difficult time, probably we have seen more technological and social innovation in education over the last year than maybe, you know, in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, let's look at higher education first. You can see uh, technology uh, was, we relied heavily on technology. It became the lifeline of education, but you can see there were limitations. Now, when you can see among university students in Europe, for example, most had a computer available, uh, but some struggled even finding a quiet place to study. And then when you look at course material, a good internet connection, this is where many young people struggle, even at the university level. Never sort of the, the <clears throat> for, for primary school kids, you can think of many things that will be an obstacle to digital learning. But for university students, you know, they've learned to learn on their own. They have, you know, access to computers, but still you could see it's not as simple as it may seem. But, you know, going back to school, I want to say it's also, this is an area where we have actually seen a lot of progress. You know, here I compare data from 2009 and 2018 in access to a computer that 15-year-old uh, students can use for schoolwork and uh, connected to the internet. So the kind of things that you need in remote learning. And this, remember, it's 2018. Uh, you can see basically in most countries, nine out of 10 students do have access. And I think that's a very encouraging signal that actually, at least technically, uh, remote learning was a credible possibility. I also want to point you to there are countries like, you know, Iceland or Korea that were always doing well already in 2003. You could see basically uh, over nine out of 10, 15 year olds having a computer at home. You can look at the United States that also was very good in 2003, but hasn't become much better. So the gap has remained. Uh, 2003, the United States was one of the front runners and 2018, it was you know, more to the end because there's been less progress. You compare that with, for example, Latvia, the Slovak Republic, the Russian Federation in 2003, only, you know, one in, f in, in five or less, fewer students had access to computer. Today is nine out of 10. You can see actually overall, you know, lots of progress in equipping people with the technology. Uh, in a way you can say for young people, the digital world has become the real world. Now, once again, from our PISA 2018 assessment, you can see Students, 15 year olds spent, uh, you know, 30, sometimes 40, sometimes close to 50 hours per week in on the internet. And the United States is actually at the high end of the distribution here. And a fair amount of that is actually in school. That's the yellow part. So once again, we have a great, uh, you know, deal of familiarity of students 
with uh, technology use. Uh, but, you know, I also want to highlight that, uh, you know, the, the other part of the coin is that, you know, being a digital native doesn't mean to be sufficiently digitally skilled. And that's also something that we looked at in 2018. To what extent have young people the navigation capabilities to actually, you know, distinguish fact from opinion, uh, search for information, use the internet strategically rather than just to get side track, uh, uh, track into clicking on something. And you can actually say that the United States is doing quite well on this. If you add to this the students who can at least actively explore the internet, you can see that you know, front runners are all in East Asia. Uh, you, you look at Hong Kong, you look at Singapore, you look at um, uh, the four regions in China, which we have, you look at Korea. Now there you have uh, uh, close to around 60% of students where we can actually say they're pretty good at navigating the internet in the United States. That's still over 40, still also quite good. Um, but it also means you have a large number of students with very limited navigation skills or what we would say almost no strategic navigation skills. Now, students cannot you know, move between different kinds of sites and navigate ambiguity, contrast, critique, uh, you know, shift places on the internet and so on. So I think that's the reality. I just wanted to show you, uh, we should not get you know, overboard. The technological policy possibilities are much greater than the actual skills that 15 year olds have. So these are real limitations that we need to keep in mind you know, when we talk about artificial intelligence, big data, learning analytics, all those great tools that exist. Now, this is something I think uh, a sort of sense of reality we need to sort of keep involved in this. Now. And obviously it's the kind of navigation skills that are closely related to performance. Now, when we actually look at the top tires of performance in the, in, on the PISA test, uh, they were also very, very good in navigating the internet. Now, literacy in the 21st century is about digital literacy. It is about you know, not extracting knowledge from linear texts, it is about constructing knowledge from complex information. And you can see basically navigation skills play a big role. And our education systems had not prepared young people really well enough to uh, do that. And in this moment of crisis, that became very apparent. In the moment where you are in presence in front of a teacher, you can sort of uh, deal without this, but at the moment uh, students rely on the internet very much, this becomes a huge issue. Let me just sort of look at the distance solutions offered uh, during 2020 or uh, 21 online platforms are basically used in every country in the OECD for which we have data. This doesn't say very much about the quality of online platforms, but you can really see they are deployed quite uh, universally. Students also use uh, many countries take home packages where students you know, were insufficiently connected. Schools made a lot of effort to equip students with other material. Television, that was a surprise for us. Basically, uh, you look at countries like Spain within you know, weeks, within two weeks, they had actually a very good television program in place for educational purposes. Yeah, many teachers became movie stars. And uh, actually, it did quite, work quite well, particularly for primary students. And that's sort of something that probably people would not have predicted. Mobile phone technology, also interesting, sometimes in combination with television, you know, television dealing with the knowledge transmission, mobile phones with the interactive parts, uh, many creative solutions, radio and other distance modalities. So a lot of things happened last year. We shouldn't underestimate the creativity that education uh, systems used. And that also will stay with us. That's also really interesting that uh, nobody wants to go back to the status quo. Only 25% of education systems say they want to see schools as they knew them. Most actually this kind of distance learning opportunities are here to stay. The first country that you know, postulated this was Singapore. They actually introduced a you know, home learning day because they saw how the value of students uh, managing their own learning, becoming sort of more active learners and uh, <clears throat> more self-efficacy. So technology became a big player, but I want to bring you back once more to the PISA assessment. Uh, again, a reality check. One of the things that we do actually see is that technology intensity in school still relates negatively to outcomes. 
No? The more students uh, play simulations at school, post work on a school website, do their homework on school, download material, and so on. All of those things, the intensity of those tasks predicts digital skills and other mathematics as well negatively. Uh, that doesn't mean technology is bad. You know, it just means maybe we are not using technology in the way that, you know, they serve educational purpose. We often use technology to conserve existing practice, particularly during a crisis, not necessarily uh, to transform it. And I think that's a very important message here that just putting computers into schools and software alone is not necessarily a good answer. Now you can see here so far, of course, there are also, you know, reverse causality here in place. It could be that weaker students are given more computers. Lots of things could be going on. But again, you know, it just raises a question mark, you know, how technology can best be deployed. And I think in the, in the aftermath of the crisis, it's not so much about reinventing technology, but more about redesigning pedagogy around this and also, you know, putting teachers at the center of this. Also, one thing, here's some interesting data from the United States, uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, CERN platform for mathematics learning, what you can see here before the pandemic, a quite uniform pattern between students from wealthy families and poor families. Then the pandemic struck and you can see learning intensity went down for everybody. But, you know, then students from wealthy backgrounds recovered very quickly, pretty much to normal levels, whereas students from disadvantaged backgrounds remained left behind. So what you can see here is even though schools did a good job in giving young people technology, digital learning requires much more. It requires that you have a supportive ecosystem at home, you know, people that, you know, encourage you to learn. You have to have the motivation to learn on your own. You have uh, the, the learning strategies to manage your learning. And you can see actually there are particularly among disadvantaged students, uh, lots of issues at stake. And this is not just for the United States. We see this in many other education systems. And then of course, you know, data protection. You can see here data from before the crisis. And here I talk about very young children in pre-primary schooling and primary schooling. You can see before the crisis, uh, basically recommendations for teachers about screen time for children. Very rare that, you know, teachers would talk to parents about, you know, limiting screen time or advice to parents uh, on adult supervised use of technology by children. Also, you know, a little bit more in primary schooling, not so much in pre-primary. But then, you know, during the pandemic, you could really see these bars becoming much, much longer. It's really interesting that actually education systems took on that lesson. Suddenly, you know, the digital world becomes the world of learning and students, schools have to think about new tasks for them. As a teacher, you were not just an instructor, you were now suddenly also, you know, a coach, a mentor, an advisor to parents and so on. And you can see here, the, in most education systems, uh, people took that challenge. And again, I think that's a, a good message that in a crisis, people seem to be capable to reinvent themselves, at least in the judgment of the system. Uh, let's talk a bit about inclusion of populations at risk in distance learning. And again, you can see lots of efforts being made. What you can see basically here is the percentage of countries that said they do, did certain things during the last year. And you can see subsidized devices now for access. You know, suddenly countries were able to pay for devices or subsidized devices now or provide asynchronous learning platforms where students could learn on their own place or uh, pro uh, improved access in remote areas, supported learners with disabilities. You almost ask yourself, you know, why we needed a pandemic to make that happen. That's something possible. In a year's time, uh, huge efforts were being made in many countries to actually ensure that students have access to technology, things that we struggle for lots of time. Again, a lot of creativity in place. Your countries like Estonia, maybe the Czech Republic, that had already made those investments uh, way before the crisis. So when the crisis struck, they were, you know, digitalization was not an issue for them. You have countries like uh, the Netherlands that were very creative. You know, everybody wanted to buy com uh, computers when the crisis struck. So schools had great difficulties getting the hardware. What did the Dutch do? They just, you know, asked companies, you know, who has old computers standing around or households, can we mobilize them, get them into schools and 
within a few weeks, every child had access to a device. So once again, you know, lots of initiative uh, in, the, in the time. But again, I think we have to ask ourselves, why does it take a crisis to even equip students with the most basic infrastructure? I already mentioned, you know, learning losses are easy to deal with. At least we know how to deal with them. Uh, emotional needs are harder to recover. At the end of the day, learning is never a transactional business. It's always a social, a relational business. Now, what young people are going to remember from this crisis 10 years from now is probably not, you know, where they learned most, but the teacher who, you know, took care of them, the teachers who understood their dreams and passions that, you know, knew how they were and knew how they, who they wanted to become and supported them in this. And I think that's, again, a very important lesson from the pandemic. If you were just a great instructor, but you didn't know how to connect to your students, you didn't know your students, you had a hard time as a teacher. And again, I think that is sticking with, with education after the pandemic. You can see lots of discussions in countries around how do we strengthen that relationship between students and teachers to give teachers more time for other things than teaching, to change the work organization so that teachers uh, learn to know their students better. Now, also very interesting, uh, here is data, again, jumping back 2018, uh, what you can see there and when we talk about student well-being, how important school really is. You know, you might think 15-year-olds, well, school is the last thing on their mind. But actually, when you look at the um, positive feelings that students express, you know, I'm happy, I feel, you know, uh, school uh, is a place where I feel safe, where I belong, and so on. You can see life at school is one of the best predictors of this. The relationship with the parents is very important. How people use their time, the way they look, uh, so I think you can really see how the environment actually of school is a very important predictor for the well-being of students beyond the academic learning. And we need to keep that in mind when we think about, you know, issues like school closures. Now, a little bit about the pandemic itself. Obviously, in the kind of pandemic situations, you can't just open schools as they were. You had to make a lot of logistical arrangements. And that's pretty much happened. You can see basically this is from, you know, February this year. You can see most countries had, you know, adjusted the physical arrangements, created, you know, safe bubbles in schools, reduced or suspended extracurricular activities. That's probably a great pity because those are so important, but obviously they're hard to maintain. Uh, decided, you know, who can return first to school, you know, how to prioritize disadvantaged groups and so on um, and so on. So it's quite impressive to see that actually in, uh, well, it took still many months, but actually now, basically those arrangements are in place. I want to sort of turn once more towards the support of students and schools. Now, very important is the remedial measures that were taken to reduce learning gaps. Uh, 77 out of, of 10 education systems in the OECD area have uh, started to address learning gaps. They also have uh, started to assess gaps in student learning. Easy to say, hard to do now when you don't see your students in front of you. How do you know where their learning gaps are? But lots of efforts really underway, uh, special focus on disadvantaged students um, and so on. Uh, the area where we have probably seen less progress and you'd like to see is career and technical education. Uh, that's much harder to deal with because that's where workplaces played a big role, employers played, play, played a big role. So I think this, those students have suffered most in the, in the pandemic in most countries. They were often not, you know, the most uh, privileged students and then their kind of learning environment worked out least. But for students following academic learning, I think things work uh, pretty well, at least at, at, in terms of the effort uh, that have been made. Exams is a, an, a, an interesting story, assessment and exams. And I just want to show you uh, something. Uh, basically, in most countries, you can see that basically uh, the previous year and the pandemic year, graduation rates were pretty much the same. But you can see a few exceptions, you know, when you look, for example, at Spain, when you look at France, when you look at Norway, and so on. And you ask yourself, you know, what's going on there? And the answer is they had suspended their exams and asked teachers to make judgments. And teachers have been much more generous than the exam is. And actually, you know, you've lots of more graduations and uh, it might be great for the people who, the extra graduates 
But obviously, you know, the labor market figures that out very quickly and so do universities. So it's actually a very troubling kind of sign, but it just shows how important objective assessment and exams really are. You know, teachers uh, don't seem to be as, as uh, uh, providing that kind of comparable judgment. And you can see that in the data, you know, some countries have canceled exams. Uh, I mentioned them already. I marked them here in red. But most countries have been quite flexible and creative to redesign their exams to be compatible with the kind of pandemic uh, context. And uh, if you're interested in this, we have you know, analyzed that all in quite uh, detail. How do you sustain learning? Obviously, it requires teachers. And uh, lots of efforts have been made to mobilize expertise teachers. When you think, for example, in Japan or New Zealand, uh, lots of retired teachers were reactivated. Not, they were, you know, given extra resources to provide tutoring, extra support to students, and so on. So actually, that was one thing. Or, you know, and if you look to the Czech Republic, to Poland, uh, Belgium, <clears throat> again, teachers were given extra resources to teach students uh, who needed remediation and things like this. But overall, this pandemic has been expensive. Now, it's costed a lot of extra resources uh, to provide the support that students needed. And probably, you know, a lot of that will be required also in the, in the years to come. Now, uh, maintaining contact with parents, that's also a really interesting story. Now, if you actually look across countries uh, in normal times, you don't have that much interaction between parents and teachers. And when you have it, it's usually focused on solving specific problems. When you look at this chart, you see suddenly, you know, every parent was connected, you know, in some countries with e-school platforms, with, uh, you know, phone calls to students, with emails, with regular conversations, with video conferencing, with parents getting curriculum material, instructional guides, support for teaching their students at home. Once again, you look at this and you ask yourself, why do we need a pandemic to make teachers part of that equation? There were some countries that have always had a great uh, tradition for this. Now, if you go for, to Korea, to Japan, uh, you'll always find this. But in much of the Western world, parents have been you know, relegated to you know, clients of the education system, not participants, not contributors. The pandemic has sort of transformed that relationship. And you can see actually in most countries, Schools did a good job to engage with this. And I think that's, again, one of the lessons I think we should take away. How do we get away from this, you know, commodification of education where students are consumers, where teachers are service providers, where parents are clients, towards making education more of a whole of society enterprise, like in this pandemic. And uh, that brings me to, to how do we support teachers? Teachers have faced a very steep learning curve. And uh, you can see among the countries, most countries have provided uh, teachers with access to additional material to teach uh, remotely. It's not an easy task. Uh, if you look at the teacher demographics in some countries, you know, the majority of teachers are over 50. So it's been actually a big investment instruction on distance education, you know, mobile technologies, television, and so on. Uh, uh, lots of things happened. We do not know the effectiveness of those efforts. It's going to take many more efforts to, to look at this. But you can see most education systems have really been trying to uh, support their teachers. Now, uh, I could have shown you data. Uh, remote learning uh, was unfamiliar to students, but also unfamiliar to the majority of teachers. Actually, you, you might think for teachers it's normal to remote, learn remotely, but that was actually the majority of cases. Actually, the only country the only places where we have data that's showing that teachers learn, that, that remote learning for teachers and remote collaboration for teachers is the norm, <coughs> are Korea and the province of Shanghai in China. In most other places, it's the exception, uh, not the norm. Uh, last, very last point is really about money. And what you could see during the crisis, uh, most education systems said in the first column, you can see have increased their budgets during the crisis. There was a lot of money around, no? and uh, that is also uh, likely to be the case in 2020-21. Uh, so the school year that we are now in, we don't have yet final data, but the predictions are also there, lots of more money available. Um, so that looks good, but you know, remember the financial crisis. Here, these are data from the past. You could see in 2008, GDP collapsed. 
and education spending, the green line increased. Now, countries did exactly what they do now. They invested stimulus money in the future to sort of keep the infrastructure going. But then look at 2009, 2010, GDP, you know, rebounded, but education spending really took a slump. So I think we have to be cautious. That might well be the kind of picture that we're going to see in the future uh, future years in the education sphere as well. It would be a great shame because you know our schools today will be our economy tomorrow. And vulnerable, particularly education systems that are largely depending on uh, private uh, financing. Now, and the United States is included in this in the higher education space. Now, where basically households need to pay. Uh, the future of whole institutions will be contingent on, on those things. Now, so um, I think I'll stop here to give you enough time for questions. Thank you very much. Excellent. So I would just encourage folks, if you do have questions there, um, you can drop them in that Q&A module. Um, and we have, at this point, plenty of time, I'm sure, to deal with uh, Quite a few questions. Um, I would also note for folks, um, because this did come up uh, during the presentation, that we will, that we are recording it, um, and folks should be able to get a copy of that recording uh, within about 24 hours of the event. Um, and looking through uh, our questions that we've had come in. Um, Let me see. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, that came in a little while ago um, about the Africa, about the data from Africa. Um, and Henry kindly pointed out that it's it's based on the PISA study from around 80 countries uh, that participated in that last round. Um, but not many were African. Do, do you have anything else that you would add to that? No, that's basically, you know, these data are based on the on the PISA survey and actually the other data that I showed you are based on the OECD countries. So that's simply the explanation that we do not cover. Sure. Excellent, excellent. Okay, hey, so we have a, a question here from Huda, who asks um, and says right off the bat, thank you for a great presentation. Um, what are your recommendations in terms of teaching instruction moving forward in the short run while teachers are still using distant learning methods and trying to move into that hybrid learning space? Yeah, you know, I think this is a this is a difficult question. I think teachers have learned many of the things the hard way. I think the most important part is that you in this moment, of course, you know, you need to know your subject as always, you need to know how different students learn that subjects, but you really need to know your students. You need to learn, understand their learning preferences, their learning environments at home, their learning constraints and so on. And I think teachers who have invested in this, uh, they're much better off in this pandemic. And um, that's actually where teaching cultures differ a lot across countries. If I look at the United States, actually teachers have relatively little time for to do other things than teaching. If you're a teacher, that's your job to teach a class one after the other. You often even don't teach the same students for many years because you rotate uh, through students. So that contact with individual students also out of the classroom is actually quite rare in the United States. If you contrast this with Japan, uh, or China, you know, their teachers would spend almost half of their time with students outside the classroom settings. They would, in the, you know, in the morning, they might teach a very large class, and in the afternoon, they would do a lot of individual tutoring, or they would work with their colleagues to discuss student results. They would, you know, uh, work with, you know, other teachers to design new lesson plans. It's a lot of out-of-school activity, and in this situation, teachers had an easier time to engage with their uh, with their students. They could sort of, uh, you know, they, they knew them, they knew the situations, they could adapt their learning style. I think that's one thing. So really having good engagement uh, with students. And um, maybe, you know, after this pandemic, we should review whether this kind of Tayloristic work organization, the predominant schooling is the right thing to do or whether, you know, 
teachers should not take on a more holistic set of responsibilities, you know, being not just a great instructor, but also a great coach, a great social worker, a great psychologist. And so I think it's a good question. I, it's, it's worth uh, uh, studying this again. Uh, the other part that is absolutely essential is the frontline capacity. And what we could see is, you know, in this moment of crisis, uh, looking upwards doesn't get you very far. You know, the system was just dysfunctional. What you now needed to be able to do is to look outwards to your neighboring teacher, to your neighboring class, to this culture of professional collaboration suddenly became extremely important. You know, do you know other teachers? Could you share information? Were you able to connect with them and so on? And once again, uh, you have education systems with a high degree of professional autonomy and a very collaborative culture. If I look to Estonia in Europe or uh, again, uh, Singapore in, in Asia, uh, um, Canada and your northern neighbor. I think there that kind of collaborative culture is quite well established, but I think that's another very important ingredient, frontline capacity. I would also say the same, you know, this time it was a pandemic, but the future will always surprise us and the resilience in education, you know, are you capable to adapt your learning environment? You know, can you reconfigure space, technology, time, people, when the time requires it uh, in a dynamic way, I think those will be increasingly important. I think the kind of bureaucratic organization of schooling will be harder to sustain. Uh, the, uh, the, it may not be a pandemic, but the future will always surprise us. Excellent, excellent. Um, we have a question here from Ling who, who says, uh, most teachers find it hard to conduct assessment, both formal and, and informal during the pandemic. Uh, what are suggested solutions um, and how uh, might the future of assessment, especially e-assessment, look for uh, both assessment and for learning? It's a good question. You know, I, I, I would actually say that uh, this pandemic has taught us that our traditional way of assessing learning, namely to disconnect it from, uh, from the learning process, is uh, probably lived out its time. Now, I, maybe you could argue that you know, one of the biggest mistakes we've made in education is to divorce learning and assessment. You know, we ask students to pile up lots and lots of knowledge. And then you know, one day we ask them to come back and tell you everything and in a very constrained artificial environment. And when that day doesn't happen, like in the pandemic, we know nothing. Now, that's a terrible thing. Uh, in, but I'm, I'm very hopeful that digitalization will help us address that. You know, when you look at the power of learning analytics, technology can now trace, you know, how students learn. And in a way, it can reintegrate the learning and assessment process that while you study, the computer will study how you study, what gets you bored, what gets you interested, where you're good at, where you need to improve and give you that immediate feedback. I think learning analytics are going to help teachers to understand better how different students learn differently. I'm, I'm quite, quite hopeful that uh, those kinds of technologies will help us to better, you know, support students in their individual learning needs without, you know, running this kind of artificial one day tests. And uh, actually, where I observed that happening at scale was in Shanghai in China. They are, actually, they are very advanced in those kinds of techniques and, and teachers are actually designers of this, you know, teachers are spend a lot of their time to actually redesign those kinds of technology tools to understand how students learn and, and, and make assessment part of the learning process. That's really my answer to you. I think that uh, the, the more we can make learning and assessment two sides of the same coin, the less we will have to worry about, you know, is the day right for running a test. Great. Um... And we've got a question here from Joaquim, um, and I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit um, and, and sort of reference, you, you mentioned that there was a lot of uh, spending on technology and additional spending that came into schools um, during the pandemic. Um, do you think that the investment to sort of uh, to address inequality, do you see that continuing? post-pandemic or um, what, what is your sort of prognostication on that investment in, um, assess, in addressing inequality? You know, I hope so, but honestly, I'm not so optimistic. You know, I think now there's a lot of money around. 
uh, soon uh, money will be scarce. There will be other public spending priorities. And uh, if the past is a predictor, uh, education is often lost out. You know, when we have to make trade-offs between the present and the future, uh, the future is always shortchanged, at least in the Western world. That's very different in the Eastern world, you know, where people value the future more and education is always a bigger part of public investment. But, you know, I, I just hope it will be different this time. And uh, I think what this pandemic has really highlighted, how much of what we do in education actually amplifies inequality. You know, in a way, this pandemic has not created inequality. This pandemic has, you know, made many inequalities apparent and reinforced them. And I think that's what we need to address. And uh, some education systems uh, do a lot around this. If you go to Northern Europe, for example, you have typically now funding formulas in place so that the money that a school gets depends on the social context of the student intake. I hope that those kinds of mechanisms will, you know, uh, uh, take uh, take root that we are becoming better to spend scarce resources more equitably. And uh, what our data from PISA also show is that more equitable investment also turn out to be more efficient investment. Because, you know, honestly, the difference that you make to a student from a very privileged background is quite moderate. Now, students from wealthy background always find their own way. <laughs> Uh, through the school system. Uh, but, you know, if you come from a disadvantaged background, a good teacher and a good school is the only card you can play. That's where school can make a huge difference. And therefore, you know, uh, relating investments to needs is a very wise and effective spending choice. And we have seen more of that emerging, uh, but I would still say far too little. I also think it's not just a question of money. Our kind of one size fits all approach to education is the other part of the problem. You know, our education systems typically are designed by people who succeeded in them, you know, and to replicate this. Uh, underserved students often have very little of, of a voice, even if there's uh, money around. And I think if we want to take on the inequalities in education, uh, we have to really take a hard look. The one thing that makes me optimistic is that this is a solvable problem. You know, we have countries among the PISA participants where you barely see a relationship between social background and learning outcomes. It's actually very, very impressive. You know, the 10% most disadvantaged students that we assessed in the province of Shanghai in China did as well as the students from the wealthiest families in the United States at age 15 in mathematics. And that really shows that, you know, and uh, uh, again, there are a number of countries, uh, Japan is doing well on this, and uh, uh, Northern Europe, Estonia, uh, Finland, where, which have actually become very, very good at disconnecting social background uh, from uh, the learning success. But quite, if you ask me today how it's going to turn out with money, I'm very doubtful that we will be able to sustain current uh, high levels of spending. Well, let's hope. That, that prognosis is proven wrong and that the spending stick uh, is maintained. Uh, we have a, a question from Berger who says uh, rather simply, but this may be more complicated. Could you please list or reiterate your priorities for building back better, quote unquote, in education? Yeah, you know, I think building back better is one thing. I think building forward differently, I think is really where probably the future is. and. Uh, Again, you know, I think uh, there are many things that we need to do to fix things. And that's, again, you know, giving priority to the most disadvantaged students, to the youngest students who lost out most during the pandemic, actually uh, redoubling our time. But when it comes to the future, I think we have to look at space, time, people and technology differently. I do believe we should take a hard look of what we expect from teachers. What is the role of a good teacher in a, when, we, when we look at the whole child, the whole student in terms of supporting students well, cognitively, socially, emotionally. And uh, I think that's a really, uh, how do we uh, create an environment where teachers you know, work with a high degree of professionalism, but also with a, in a, in a collaborative culture where teachers, where the frontline capacity becomes real. Uh, many people in the, in the United States tell me, oh, well, you know, we have a lot of autonomy, you know, districts have a lot of discretion and so on. If you look at this through the eyes of a teacher, actually, you know, American teachers, American school leaders have a lot less discretion than many of the European counterparts. 
So I think that's something I think also, you know, we need to look at what is the right distribution of decision-making responsibilities in a system that needs to be structurally more resilient. This is my, my biggest worry that, you know, building back better is that we are build, rebuilding the kind of bureaucracies that have been part of the problem, not that are not part of the solution. All right. Well, uh, again, let's hope that, that we are able to take that and, and build back differently. Uh, we, we have a question here from Charlene who asks, what barriers in the United States prevent parent-teacher partnership that sort of began to develop during the pandemic? And is there anything that districts or school districts can do to foster uh, moving forward those sorts of um, parent-teacher partnerships? I'm very hopeful. I think this is something uh, uh, in this pandemic, parents you know, moved from the eyes of schools from being part of a problem to become really a, a big part of the solution. I think schools understood where they didn't have parents you know, behind them, they couldn't very, do very much in this remote learning environment. So I think sort of parents and schools have moved closer together. Parents are not just you know, clients, but they became real participants. And I, and, and technology has made a huge difference there. You know, the kind of networks that we have seen among parents, the social kind of uh, media use, the kind of platforms, the curriculum material that has been made available to parents. I can see no reason why we wouldn't continue with this. I think that is in the best interest of schools. We've seen that it's possible. And what I think is most interesting, we've seen actually that parents are very willing to do this. You know, uh, many people would have assumed, well, you know, that's not something that... Uh, parents want to do. But actually, the moment the, the tools were available, uh, schools also reached a lot more disadvantaged parents that are typically very hard to reach with traditional methods. You know, you invite people to school, well, you know, you don't get those people you need most. Actually, going to parents through technology and learning platforms uh, and, and, and these uh, video chats and so on actually proved to be quite effective. And I think this is one of the best lessons I think we should take away from the pandemic, how to keep that kind of fabric. Because I can tell you in education systems where there is a very close fabric between social fabric, between families and schools, education works a lot better. So it's a lesson that you can take from many kind of private schools that are very good in creating that kind of ethos at school where actually parents are really very closely integrated. Same story. So I think this is something where if you want to make a difference to uh, also to a social disadvantage, to inequity, that's where you can start. Now, I give you just one, one number. You know, in one PISA survey, we asked parents about, you know, <clears throat> how often, how they engaged with students about, uh, you know, school. And the simple fact whether parents ask their children every day, you know, how was school? which doesn't take a degree and it doesn't take, you know, three hours of learning with your, with your children. The simple fact of showing to your child what you do in school is important to me had a bigger impact on learning outcomes than parental income. And that tells us actually, it's not rocket science. I think it's something where we could and, and uh, use technologies to make a big difference. Excellent. We have a question here from Mina, from Mina excuse me who says, as an educator for 30 years uh, in, in research and education now, I totally agree with your points, particularly the, quote, need to move away from the commodification of education. How do we approach this effectively? Uh, and for example, in the UK, education is currently working to contrive a business model of leadership, assessment, and performance management for teachers. So how do you approach uh, moving away from the commodification of education? Well, you know, actually, I, I didn't mean so much the kind of uh, commercial aspects of this. In fact, you know, quite honestly, the commodification is as bad in public schools as it is in private schools often. You know, actually, I think it's more a question of attitude. You know, what do we expect from school? Is it a kind of social service? You know, I pay so to get a, get my, my child ready to go to Harvard? Or is it something, you know, is it, a, is a, is it the center of, of the community where everybody tries to contribute whatever they can? And I think that's more the attitude question. I can see that happening also in systems where you know many schools are privately run. I don't think it's so much a matter of public, private. It's more a question of what institution is school in our society. And uh, I must say, you know, we we look at lots of things in the in in our international comparison. 
what image do we give to young people if you know the most beautiful building is the shopping center in a community and the school is a rundown kind of old-fashioned siloed building with small dark classrooms I mean, lots of things come together in this. And I think that really, I think, is, is the, the heart of the issue. How do we get everybody engaged in that kind of learning experience? And uh, also, how do you open school wards? Schools are often good at keeping students inside and the rest of the world outside. How do we can actually create a more integrated environment where communities have a role in school and schools go out to the communities. That's really what I mean this. And uh, unfortunately, the last 10, 15 years have worked in the opposite direction. Schools tended to become more, you know, institutions where you as a parent became a client, school become a service provider, and so on. I think the, the past has not been very good in that sense. But again, I think this is an opportunity the pandemic provides. I think it really has shown us that School is a social enterprise, not a transactional enterprise. No. Great. So we have a question here from Zen who asks, is it possible that using techni techniques like AI and virtual reality and those sorts of things, uh, is that something that you know could be happening for distance education in the near future? Absolutely. You know, actually, there are many, many good examples, even pre-pandemic. Uh, I think the pandemic has just brought them to scale. But, you know, I, I believe AI is a very powerful tool when it comes to transaction. A AI can personalize learning so much more than a classroom setting can. You know, a computer can figure out how you learn differently from others. It can make your learning more interactive, more adaptive, uh, more reflective even. Uh, I think there's a great power. AI can also, you know, the, 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 the power of learning analytics as a teacher, you can get so much better of a sense how different students learn differently and embrace that diversity with more differentiated uh, pedagogies. That's the potential. But, you know, the, the one point I want to make is, you know, that this technology, you know, it's not replacing the function of teachers. It's just amplifying the good teaching capacities because, uh, the worst combination is great technologies and poor teachers, because what that actually means that learning will become more scripted. You know, AI is never a magic power. AI is always a you know great accelerator, a great amplifier. It amplifies good practice and good ideas in the same way it amplifies bad practice and bad ideas. As a teacher, you know, as I said, it can help you understand how different students learn differently, but it can also reinforce stereotypes if you do not have that kind of you know, uh, deep understanding of, of learning. So again, you know, I think uh, technology can help to elevate the teaching profession. It can scale good learning experiences. It can make learning more granular. It can enhance equity. Again, by engaging students with special needs could be one of the biggest beneficiaries of technology. Uh, but there's no, also there, there's no automaticity. In fact, once again, the crisis has shown that technology can also easily amplify inequality. Now. So it really depends that uh, to, to have, you know, the right uh, caliber of teachers who are creative designers of new technologies. One of the worries I have is, you know, that schools get into a, get into a mood of, you know, just purchasing hardware and software. And I don't think, you know, if you do not engage educators and teachers in the design of those technologies, they cannot help you with implementing this. That's, I think, a big lesson we take away from this. So once again, it's a matter of work organization. Technology is a very important part of that mix, but uh, it does require really, I think, a very high, high, high caliber of teachers. So sticking with uh, talking about teachers a, a little bit more, um, we have a question from Beth who says, it sounds like you're calling for teachers and parents to do more, uh, but both of, of these groups are already overwhelmed in many cases. Um, how can sort of social structures and educational structures um, support both groups as they, they try to engage more with students? You know, I agree with this only in part. You know, what overwhelms us is often not, you know, the task that we need to do, but the lack of connections and the lack of support. You know, uh, if you are working in four walls of a classroom with all of those tasks on your own, yeah, you get easily overwhelmed. If you're well integrated into a community in school, you know, you have your teachers, you you you, you co-create lesson plans, you have the time to reflect on this 
actually, you know, I can tell you this because we study workload. And actually, we know the number of hours teachers work and we know their perceived levels of stress. And I can tell you very clearly that actually uh, the number of hours that, for example, teachers spent with students is not very closely related to the stress that people perceive. The lack of isolation is the lack of bureaucracy teachers face. So, again, you know, I'm not convinced that actually objectively we have a system you know, where, where, where people are terribly overloaded. I really think that many of the stress factors that we see in, in the education systems are inherent in its kind of Tayloristic uh, factory-like design, where we actually you know, have a, a lot of vertical structures and vertical accountability mechanisms, but we have very little in terms of the kind of lateral inter infrastructure that makes people comfortable and makes people supported in their work environment, where, you know, um, as, as, as a good school leader these days, you know, don't ask yourself how, whether your teachers follow your instructions. Ask yourself, you know, how well can my teachers actually collaborate? How well are they good together? And I think, so in that sense, you know, the, the, the workload story uh, is not totally convincing to me. <clears throat> All right. Um, we've got a question here from Ling who says, uh, are there any possibilities for teachers and educators the world over to form an alliance to learn from each other and work toward a future of education together, like developing a teaching and learning pool, a practical experience sharing platform or, or anything like that? You know, the good thing is that there are some education systems where this is really well established. Uh, if you look to Singapore, you know, every teacher is part of a learning community. Every teacher has at least 100 hours of professional learning time a year, where, you know, and there's only one teacher training institution. So you're always going to meet your former colleagues there. You can discuss with them. And uh, you many teachers go into school after a bachelor, then, you know, they continue to study to make their bachelor. So learning and working is one of the same thing. I think that's so you become a community of, of educators. As a teacher, you do research work, you're involved in inquiry, and so on. Another country where this is really well developed is, is China, actually, at least the developed provinces of China that I know very well, where, you know, and there actually a lot of technology is used, you know, teachers, typically are, you know, can uh, upload their ideas, projects, lesson plans, uh, research uh, concepts on a digital platform. And then the more other teachers download your ideas, improve your ideas, criticize your ideas, the more popular you become in the system. And actually at the end of the school year, your principal will not give you, you know, a test how well did your students perform or how well you did teach your students, but they will typically ask you, what contribution did you make to the education system? How did you work with colleagues? How do other colleagues respect you? And so on. So I think we can create that collaborative culture with better support, uh, incentives to actually uh, you know, uh, reward the contribution that teachers make. We have still, and again, I come back to this industrial culture. We have still this idea, you know, there is someone sitting in the government who knows what every student should be learning or somewhere else. And then a publishing industry producing books and teachers, you know, deliver this. No, actually, I think a good education system these days is about teachers at the front line who are really good designers of innovative learning environments. And if you don't do that in regular time in the pandemic, you have to work this way. <laughs> All right. And I think we will since we are coming up on our, our very last minute here, we will leave it there with the questions. Um, and I will just take a moment to thank, say thank you so much for taking the time um, to walk through this data rich presentation and to field so many questions. Um, we, we really appreciate your taking the time to do so, Andreas. Um, and I would also just say to folks out there, please do note that we recorded the program today. Um, so please do be on the lookout for that follow-up link. Um, you should receive it within about 24 hours of the live event. Um, and also, as we come to the end here, if you have just a few minutes to fill out a brief survey um, reflecting on the presentation today, we would really appreciate your input. Um, your responses do help us improve um, these presentations and how we run them. Um, also, please do visit uh, the oecdilibrary.org. Um, and for any additional information or to answer any questions that you may have about the presentation today or about the iLibrary, please do contact Ian Williamson. You can reach him on the phone at 
445-9125 or at the e email address ian, that's I-A-I-N dot Williamson with two L's at OECD.org. Uh, thanks again to all of you out there for joining us today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session and we hope to see you in the near future on another webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mark.